I don't for what it's worth. Is it amino acid? Interestingly, right. many of these things have. So it was very beneficial for. My name is Matt Caberlin, and welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. Uh, coming to you today live from the Ritz-Carlton in uh, Santa Barbara, here for an American Federation for Aging Research and Glenn Foundation uh, grantees conference with the DT Gurkar from uh, the University of Pittsburgh Aging Center. Uh, a DT is a, are you assistant or associate? You're coming up for associate. Yeah, yeah so we'll talk about that. Uh, assistant professor of geriatric medicine there. Um, studies the biology of aging, broadly speaking, but I think special emphasis on DNA damage, senescence, maybe moving a little bit more into metabolism, mitochondria. Does that sound right? Absolutely. All right, I did my homework. Yes, you did. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be able to sit down and chat with you. And um, I think there'll be all sorts of interesting uh, topics that we can cover. Um, so maybe I, I kind of like to start these conversations to, to hear about how you got interested in the biology of aging and, you know, what was it that first got you on this path? Well, that's, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. I <laughs> love, I love Opti, OptiSpan uh, podcast. So thank you. Um, what got me started in the biology of aging? This is a funny, funny story. Um, but I was 10 years old and I grew up in India and in India, we usually grew up with our grandparents in the same house. And so my grandparents were a very big part of my life growing up. And, you know, in Mumbai, that's where I lived. Um, we had a one, ap one bedroom apartment with my parents, my brother, and my grandparents all living in the same house. <laughs> <laughs> um, so good for me. I'm not sure, you know, they really wanted to hang out with their grandkids all the time. Yeah. But that's how life was. And um, my, my grandfather just was an amazing person, was very functional till the very end of life. Um, he died at 83, mm. but only got detected with cancer maybe three months before he died. And and so until then, he was super functional, right? He would pick me up from school. He would do homework with me and, and, and play with me and whatnot. And then my grandmother, on the other hand, she also died at 83. But for the last five years of her life, she could not get out of bed. And I started wondering why, like, two people who are living in the same house just are so different from each other and they age so differently. Um, and I had seen her functional, you know, before that, but the last 15 years of her life were really like no quality of life. Mm -hmm. And also that was tough as a kid because it was also like really challenging for the family. I, I saw it firsthand how my parents would never go on a vacation, right? Because they always had to take care of my grandma. Um, and they never thought of it as a chore. Right. You know, it was a blessing having her with us. And so, but it was still tough for me to watch. And I, I thought like, there must be something that it, people seem to age very differently. And so that's what really got me into the field of aging. Although I had not contextualized it completely. Um, so I ended up coming to the U.S. when I was 17, um, wanting to study um, cancer because mm -hmm. I thought that's what I had to do with my grandfather's story. Um, and I actually did my grad school as well as my uh, first postdoc, all in oncology space. And in that phase, I realized, you know, all the drugs that we were testing were like in these genetic models that were very young. And none of these drugs could really be translated. They were failing. Although in, in these preclinical models, they were yeah, amazing, they were yep. right? And, and, and that's when I realized like, oh, I'm doing this the wrong way. Hmm. So um, I, I felt like we really had to start studying these diseases, but in the context of aging. And so age becomes really important. And, and so that's how changed my perspective again. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I mean, I think what, what you said about the animal models um, is, is absolutely correct that, again, the extent to which the reason why these 
preclinical therapies fail is because the studies are usually done in young animals. That's harder to prove, but I think there's a pretty good chance that plays a big, big role. But um, it's interesting that you kind of came to that conclusion yourself and then moved into the idea of like, you know, how should we be doing these experiments and what is the real change that goes along with aging that creates this permissive environment for disease. Um, I'm going to just check and make sure this is recording because again, I'm super paranoid. <laughs> All right, we're good. Um, but I also think, you know, the, the story you told about your grandparents illustrates the concept that every, obviously everybody in the field is familiar with, but, but this, this difference between health span and lifespan, right. And that, that, you know, Two people can have exactly the same lifespan and yet very different health span trajectories. And, and so you saw that firsthand in your own experience. Yeah. I mean, I think that's when this idea, um, again, which I had not contextualized completely back then, was that your biological age mm. is very is could be very different from right. your chronological age, right. right? And and so it's honestly such a circle for me because, you know, starting from that initial idea, now getting to actually do the things I want to do um, and really see this firsthand, you know, has been an amazing journey. And so do you think that your focus on DNA damage, um, at least initially, comes from your background in oncology? Or is there another reason why that's that's it? for lack of a better way of saying it, the, the hallmark of aging that you've really spent a lot of time focused on? I think it's both. One, um, it does come from the cancer space. And, and my grad school was all about um, looking at DNA damage and the cell cycle and also looking at these cells um, that would exit the cell cycle called senescence, right? Mm -hmm. And then realizing that senescence is a big hallmark of aging as well. Um, but the second thing about this whole idea and why I've kind of really stuck on to studying aging, um, DNA damage and aging has been that um, we are born with that same DNA and we die with that same DNA, right? Um, now, when you think about other organelles like mitochondria or the lysosomes, if they're not functioning well, the cells have a way to get rid of these right. and make new ones. Uh, but that doesn't happen with DNA. And so... And 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 we're constantly bombarded with DNA damaging agents, right? Um, just walking, being in Santa Barbara and getting <laughs> some sun. of that sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, I, I, it, it's actually not as sunny as I was hoping for here. But still, coming from Seattle, definitely get more of the the um, sun, the solar rays than we get. Up exactly. North. <laughs> Same with Pittsburgh. It's yeah. always overcast. So, you know, I'm enjoying a little bit of the sun, yeah. but I'm also sure that I've gotten some um, UV adducts yeah. <laughs> now in my DNA. And and so I guess that's also been one of the reasons that I've been really looking at DNA damage and aging. So let me ask you what might be a provocative question, which is, you know, there are I think many people now who believe that if we can reset the epigenetic changes, we can, you know, revert the reverse aging, right? Or at least reverse many aspects of aging. So how does that fit into the idea that we can't reset the DNA damage? And where do you fall in this, this, you know, spectrum of people who say that if we can reprogram that we can reverse everything, or if we reprogram you know, we won't be able to actually have a large impact because the 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 DNA damage is permanent. Where's your where have you sort of landed on that? Um, that's actually a very provocative question, <laughs> um, and a great one. And and without the data, it's tough to say where we are going to fall. But the one thing that even our studies have shown is it's how the cell responds to the damage that might yeah, be much right. more important than the damage in itself. Yeah. And so if we go on that principle, you know, we may not be able to fix the damage that already exists on the DNA, but if we can fix how the cell responds to this damage, you know, we might still have ways to improve yeah. health. Yeah. Right? Let's double click on that. I think that's really important, right? Because the, I think you're right. There are multiple examples now where, you get damage to the genome and potentially other types of damage as well. And it is the repair mechanisms or response mechanisms that engage that actually are the problem, right? Um, and we see this in the context of inflammation in many cases, right? So this, this chronic inflammation that happens with aging is really a response 
to damage, if you bring down that chronic inflammation, you can have a lot of beneficial effects. The damage is still there, right. but it's really the the response that is driving the pathology. And so to some extent, senescent cells, I think, would fall into that category as well, right? Right. Senescence. And and also, like we've, we've shown before, that also um, one of the genes that that turns on when there is DNA damage is P53, mm-hmm. right? And there, there could be this chronic activation of P53, which is probably not good, right? right? And, and the same thing, if you tune it down, actually you have better improvements in, in health, even though the damage exists. Yeah, so, this is actually a good example for people who maybe aren't in the weeds on this. To, to I think this is conceptually maybe easier to to appreciate a specific case example. So P53 is a classic tumor suppressor gene. And when you get DNA damage, you activate P53 typically to drive cell death, right? Apoptosis. Right. Um, And so that's important because you want to kill the cells become before they become cancer cells, right? So that's the, that's thought to be the reason why you do that. But if you do that too much, or if you get P53 killing cells that shouldn't be killed, you lose too many cells. And then you actually, if I remember correctly in mice, right, you get what looks like a premature aging phenotype. Absolutely. If you have too much apoptosis, that's the cell death pathway, right? right. So that actually seems to be a common feature. So may, actually this, this may be, you can tell me if this fits with your experience or observations. I kind of feel like in the literature, there are a whole bunch of these accelerated aging models in mice, and they kind of fall into a couple of camps. One is too much apoptosis, so you're killing cells that shouldn't be killed, or too much senescence, right? Where So you're, so again, we haven't really defined senescence here, but we've talked about it before. So maybe you can define how does, sene- how is senescence different from apoptosis? Okay. So both of them are sulfate decisions, right? So when something like a stress happens, like DNA damage, um, the cell can decide to stop um, entering the cell cycle where it's proliferating. And, and we want to do that because we don't want to spread cancer, right? right. Um, and in that context, it will undergo cell cycle arrest and try to repair what's been damaged. Um, but the cell can also decide that there's just too much damage and instead it just has to undergo apoptosis where the cell dies. It's one form of cell death. The other cell decision uh, mechanism is senescence, where the cells exit the cell cycle so they don't proliferate anymore. Um, but what is interesting about these cells is although they cannot form cancer cells by proliferation, they start releasing a number of chemokines, cytokines, lipids that all cause sort of this chronic inflammation, just like you talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and that causes dysfunction to nearby cells um, and, and drives sort of what we think is age-related um, diseases, right? Yeah. So, so this is something I'm not as familiar with, so I'm, I'm interested to hear you talk more about it. So for a long time, right, we've known that senescent cells give off this SASP, right, the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And the first things that were characterized there were the cytokines, right, which were which are known to be immune-activating molecules. But you said senescent cells give off a lot of lipids, which, which can also be very inflammatory. So tell me more about that, because this is something I haven't really followed, and how much is that thought to be one of the drivers of the chronic inflammation we think senescence contributes to? Yeah. Um, so we we know now that there are these lipid mediators um, that senescent cells seem to... And, and, and again, this is just more... The newer the technologies are coming up, we are actually looking at this in much more granular ways. So initially, why we picked on... And, and amazing studies by Compizzi Lab, right, um, looked at looked at SASP, right, um, where they did like a pre-picked a panel of chemokines right. and cytokines because right. that's what you had to do back right. then. Um, and and again, from um, Compizzi Lab um, and Chris Wiley um, and others now in the field, they have now looked at what other things in essence cells can release. And it looks like there are these lipid mediators that also get released by senescent cells. Some of these lipid mediators, um, especially the ones that come from arachidonic acid, which is a particular type of lipid, um, which is a a polyunsaturated fatty acid, um, 
gets acted upon um, by lipooxygenases. And what it does is makes these lipid mediators. Now, lipid mediators can have functions that are good for you as well as bad for you. And where is this happening? This is extracellular? This is in the cell. In the senescent cell itself. In the senescent cell itself. And they're releasing these lipid mediators now. So then they act as signaling molecules. Right, right. And, And what we know, at least for now, is it's It definitely comes from a senescent cell. That's all we can tell. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's actually a good thing or a bad thing, there's still so much to be done in that area. But it's thought that these lipid mediators can also drive an inflammatory response? Absolutely. Yeah. So lipid mediators have both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory yeah. roles, right? Um, and this particular lipid mediator that comes from arachidonic acid is thought to be more pro-inflammatory. Um, and this is just one example because, again, in the space, the technology is just improving now where we can detect more of these lipids, right? So right. there's a whole space that, I, that I'm that i really excited that the field's going to enter um, and some really good people in the field are, are working on. Cool. So, so when did you first start working on senescence then and studying senescence? Yeah, so I started working on senescence when I was in grad school. Oh, okay. Not in, in the, the context con- of cancer. In the context of cancer huh. and in the context of the cell cycle. And for me, it's just been like this whole big circle. And I am now getting to study senescence in the context of aging, uh, which has been great. Uh, but starting out, it was just one of those self-aid decisions. It was a time where, you know, nobody even understood why would a cell, if it could if it could undergo apoptosis, cell death, why would it choose yeah. to undergo senescence? <laughs> right. Right. And 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 even today I get asked that question quite a bit. What's the answer? <laughs> um, at least for now, what we can say is senescence again is a is has good roles and bad, right? We have not understood everything. But in case of wound healing, for right. example, right, um, there is this this transient increase in senescence, which kind of um, gives out these SASP signals and brings in immune cells, brings in other fibroblasts to repair that wound. And that's important, I think, for people to appreciate, right? You want inflammation in certain contexts, and a wound is is a good example of that. And so this may be a case where the senescent cells are actually important for this necessary or desired inflammatory response in that context. So that could be why senescent cells evolved. That's one reason. I mean, we know senescence is also important in like early development and in mm-hmm. as well. Um, but uh, that could be one reason why senescence evolved as a specific type of cell fate. And then the immune system in normal situations will clear those senescent cells. But as we get older, you know, the immune system stops functioning as well. We get accumulation of senescent cells. I mean, it's a very plausible model. We'll see if that holds up 10 years from now. But. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, and that's the good thing about science is you get to test all your models. Um, so there's, again, so much to be done in the space. And, and we've obviously, we've made it sort of simple models but it is going to be much more complex, I think. Um, just having senescent cells in every different or in every tissue, are they all going to be good or bad with age? Who knows? Yeah. Right. So it's it's going to be a thing that we'll have to actually test. Um, we do know that many of the markers of senescence do seem to go up in multiple diseases that come up with age, like IPF, which is idiopathic right. pulmonary fibrosis. Right. Um, but the question is, if you get rid of all of those senescent cells, is that good or bad for you? Yeah. So, and I mean, I think this gets to a question which I'm interested to hear hear you comment on, which is even how do we define a senescent cell? So you said senescent cell markers, right? It seems like even within the senescence community, there is maybe not consensus on what what the right set of markers is. And so maybe you could start by giving a what is a what is a definition of a senescent cell that most or everybody in the community would accept and then from that how do what are maybe some of the the differences of opinion or what's the gold standard sort of way that you would actually detect a senescent cell that's that's an excellent question 
Um, I think currently most of us think that senescent cells um, are cells that have entered a stable cell cycle arrest stage. So they don't proliferate. And would most people agree that's a permanent thing or is that is that to be determined at this point? To be determined, <laughs> I think mostly we think like, again, the data really looks like permanent for now. But, you know, again, permanent until somebody shows that it's <laughs> exactly, not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so there is this permanent cell cycle arrest. Um, the other features of a senescent cell are they're usually larger cells. Mm -hmm. Um, they also, um, have the main thing though, is that they have the SASP phenotype, right. right? And why I point that out is a cell can enter cell cycle arrest and be called a quiescent cell and under right. the right circumstances, under the right growth conditions, those cells can enter the cell cycle, right? Right. And so there is this, this idea out there that we don't know the context where a senescent cell can go back into the cell cycle, possibly, right? It's a provocative question. Yeah, I mean, presumably, there, presumably this is mostly driven by epigenetic changes, and there should be a way to reverse the epigenetic state of a senescent cell to convert it to a quiescent cell, which then in principle should be able to reenter the cell cycle. I mean, is there another explanation? So, what would be the the mechanism by which you would not you would have a truly irreversible cell cycle arrest? Um, I um, guess yes, you are right. I unless think... it was like loss of a chromosome, some sort of major DNA rearrangement, right? Right. Actually, that's a that's actually a very good very good point. So, I do think yes, there might be this epigenetically programmed or maybe not programmed but but a stochastic way where there's just um parts of the dna that have been silenced maybe yeah right and and, and if you can reprogram it but so they say have people right. tried reprogramming I mean, people i know people have tried this what's happened in those experiments reprogramming senescent cells yeah using the yamanaka factors or some other Technology. There has been controversial results there as well, um, partly because, um, you know, some of the studies were done when there was not this concept of partial reprogramming, yeah. right? And and now, like, with this new concept of partial reprogramming rather than complete reversal or reprogramming, um, there's been slightly different results. So we still have to actually get to the bottom of it. Um but several studies from even Manuel Serrano's lab um, showed that, you know, senescent cells may not be able to enter the cell cycle and, and become proliferating cells again. However, the SASP that they release might be an important part of the whole reprogramming, meaning cells that are next or are, are bystander cells that are not senescent may benefit from having some of these SASP factors. During reprogramming. During reprogramming. Okay, interesting. But again, huh. you know, this is such a nascent field. Yeah, it's very, at this very point. early days. So and, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> I think there's just so much in the space to be done. Um, but at the moment, the definition of senescence would be a cell that exits the cell cycle in somewhat of a permanent way. And it releases a number of these SAS factors. Um, and then we we kind of come up with a list of like several markers that we think could be associated with senescence. Yeah. To be very honest, a lot of these markers are cell cycle arrest markers, right? It's a little bit of a circular argument. It's exactly, exactly. And which is why the field as a whole um, is looking at what could be the actual markers of senescence. Yeah. And there's a growing, again, correct me if I'm wrong, it's my impression there's a growing consensus that there are multiple flavors of senescent cells and maybe the tissue type is partly, there are going to be different senescent cells in different tissue types, or maybe the, the path to which a cell becomes senescence influences that. So are there any sort of general themes for, for what those 
different flavors of senescent cells are and what their characteristics are? Yeah, no, I mean, we thought we knew the answers, but the more you dig into it, yeah, it just, and, and again, with the more newer technologies we have, we're like, oh, we must be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or it, with the model was incomplete. I the think model that's the was way I like incomplete. to say it. Yeah. The model was incomplete. Exactly. I think um, we do know now that there's no one marker for senescence. So there's no universal marker for senescence. So there's nothing that we know of that other than than potentially irreversible cell cycle arrest that is and constant SASP. in every... Okay, so, but the SASP is sort of defined the, by... The, the SASP can can change right, right? so the, the what the what exactly the sasp is is different in in different right. contexts but we do know that these cells do secrete something but all cells secrete something <laughs> <laughs> no but these cells seem to secrete a lot of these the pro-inflammatory pro factors. Okay. factors. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um so that part I think is is true. Um and I, but in it, it it depends on what the stress inducer was um, that leads to some of these molecular changes. Um, so exactly at this point, we have no idea of what set of molecular markers we could use to define as a, a senescence. universal senescence right. detector. And there okay. might be none, to be honest. Uh, you know, that's a fair answer. So, so I mean, this is interesting because because in your poster here, you were talking about some technology that your lab has been working on that is part of a grant from the American Federation for Aging Research and Evolution Foundation um, that is geared towards a different way of detecting senescent cells. So to the extent you're able to talk about, I know it's unpublished stuff, but to the extent you're able to talk about it, maybe you can give us a feeling for what you're doing in the, in this context? Sure. I mean, this is a really exciting project. And, and again, I've been really blessed because I guess I talk about aging and senescence to everyone I meet. <laughs> <laughs> that which tends to good, happen. <laughs> which is a good or a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but I ended up talking to a physicist about senescence and how like the most important question right now is to look at aging and how can we, um, live healthier lives till the very end of life. Um, and I, I ended up getting this physicist very interested in senescence. Um, and she's a nanomaterial expert. And um, she has these magnetic nanoparticles um, that her lab's been using for a number of uh, methods, including cancer detection. Um, so we sat down and we were like, maybe there is a way to explore biology of senescence by using the physics of nanoparticles. So what I mean by that, um, there are some salient features of senescent cells that are not easily captured by molecular markers. For example, like I said, a senescent cell is usually larger in mm -hmm. volume. Right. Um, it also has a higher iron content. You know. How much higher? What's the what's the difference between a senescent cell and a non-senescent cell, roughly, ballpark? I don't know the answer to that, to be very honest. Why I say that is because there is another form of cell that called ferroptosis. Ah, sure, right. Right? And that involves iron as well, right? So currently, we have not examined, um, you know, all these different um, cell that... Uh, our cell decision um, um, areas and looked at if the iron content is different okay. between everything. Okay, I'm going to get in the weeds for just a second because I can't help myself. But <laughs> do you know in senescent cells whether the location within the cell of the iron changes and whether the oxidation state changes? I, I do not know the answer okay. to that, to be honest. I think there is, again, so much there to be done. Yeah. Partially because I think we'll have to go at a single cell level and really examine these pools of iron. Yeah. That I think are there. that might turn out to be really interesting. The reason why my mind went there is, you know, one of the one of the projects that we had in in my lab at UW, this was in yeast, but you know, yeast go through a replicative senescence mm -hmm. process and then the the cells go into an irreversible um, cell cycle arrest, but they stay alive for a while in that state. So that's they don't give off, well, maybe they give off a SASP. We never looked. But right. but in that context, we saw that during aging, there is an induction of an iron starvation response transcriptionally. So the cells are acting as if they are sensing 
a lack of iron, but they actually had the same amount or more iron in the cell. And we never really figured out exactly what was going on, but we wondered if the iron was becoming sequestered in the mm. vacuole, which is the yeast version of the lysosome, and that the oxidation state was changing. So it was no longer usable iron. And so I wonder if there is some parallel here wherein senescent cells, the iron is being sequestered somewhere. The cells then take up more iron because they think they're starving. And that's why you see this increase in iron. So it could be completely yeah. wrong, but no. it's just, you know. Exactly. I, I think, again, like there's just so much to be done in this space. Do we that... know if the cytoplasmic or lysosomal pH changes in senescent cells? Because that can affect the iron storage right. properties as well. Absolutely. So what we do know is the lysosomes change structurally mm. as well mm -hmm. um, in senescent cells. And... Um, that's how one of the markers that's been popularly used is senescence-associated beta-galactosidase. Right, of course. Yes. Right? And and that's a lysosome. And a pH-dependent. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So Sorry, guys. I can't help it. I got way <laughs> off in the weeds here, but this is... <laughs> This is the kind of thing that I think is fun. So yeah. hopefully you do too. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is exactly why we do think all of these different changes, though, if you try to look at them molecularly, we are never able to contextualize them as a whole to yeah. get a picture or a snapshot of what where the cell is in that decision, right? Um, versus we figured if we use magnetic nanoparticles... So the magnetic nanoparticles would detect these changes based on the volume changes, the shape changes, um, changes in iron content, changes in even organelle structure and the density of these different organelles altogether. Um, this would change the magnetic signature or, or we would have a very different magnetic signature in a senescent cell versus in a cell that's just proliferating or quiescent. This is again out of the box idea yeah. for yeah. now. Fascinating. Um, and and we just have to test to see if we will ever get there. But I do think we kind of in the field of aging in general, we need to come up with out of the you know out of the box ideas. Absolutely um, right. I mean, I think you, you you guys didn't get to hear my talk or didn't have to hear, depending on your viewpoint at this conference. But I mean, that was, was one, of, one of the points that I made was that we really need more sort of innovative out of the box approaches to, you know, discover what we don't know. And so I agree completely that these kinds of projects are necessary. And I'm glad to see that that um, some of them are being being funded. Um, so just to kind of connect the dots, though, so you can you in in theory, I guess you haven't you don't know yet, but in theory, senescent cells will have a different magnetic signature mm -hmm. and you should be able to detect that. And you could then use imaging modalities like MRI to be able to in to maybe <laughs> right. in vivo quantify different types of senescent cells, senescent cell burden in tissues and organs spatially. Is that right? Right. That the end that's, game? that's the end game. That's yeah. the end game. And and I, I you know, when I think about it, I mean, I'm a scientist, so I have to cross all my T's and dot all my I's. And I I feel like it's sci fi if I say that right <laughs> now, right? But I that's, think I said it. You didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like again, like there at least seems a reasonable hypothesis that needs to be tested. Um, and what better time to do than than now? Um, and, you know, we might have to, if, if this ends up working, there might be like other ways of like making sure we can even deliver drugs to senescent yeah, cells. Yeah, right. right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and kind of I, I even know like what, where it, depending on spatial localization of these senescent cells, the senolytics or the senotherapeutics we use might actually have to be different. Yes. Um, and this has been a big challenge in the field. Although a lot of people have looked at senolytics and done amazing uh, work in that area, one of the questions has been, when do we start giving people these senotherapeutics, yeah. right? And that brings us back to that circular argument that we have no markers for senescence. So how do we even quantify when should a person get it? And even if it's did effective, it yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. The efficacy. So okay, so this is a this is a question that I don't know if there is an answer, but I'm interested in your 
opinions, which is, you know, it seems like in the literature, looking at the senolytic therapies that have been tested primarily in mice, although there's now some, some clinical trial data starting to come out. I mean, where do you fall in your confidence that clearing, so let me say this two ways. Where do you fall in your confidence that clearing senescent cells, if we could do that, will have large therapeutic benefits for lifespan and or health span? And then what is your opinion on how effective the senolytics that have been tested so far in the animal models actually were at clearing senescent cells? Those are potentially two different things. They are. And again, I think that when we started out, you know, there was at least genetically, the system seemed to be very clean. So what I mean by that is there were these earlier studies um, by Darren Baker right. and others in the group, um, as as well as, you know, the Kempisi lab, um, where they used models to clear out P16 positive cells or P21 positive cells. And, and Ming Shu's lab as, as well does this now. And and there seems to be definitely some benefits, right? Um, are these the only senescent cells that exist? Or there might be actually a group of senescents that's even worse or better? Who knows? Or might there also be cells that are not senescent that are being killed in these cases? Exactly. For sure. For sure. Because not all P21 positive cells or P16 positive cells are senescent, right? Right. Um, but it seemed to like at least improve health span. And that's where this idea of using senolytics came right. from. Yep. Um, and so the first line of senolytics that were developed, um, based on the technology we had back then, it looked like it could clear off um, P16 positive cells. How, and what are the the senolytics that you're talking about specifically? Um, both ABT as well as DNQ. Uh-huh. Um, Desatinib and quercetin. Yes, yep. desatinib and quercetin. Um, and and seem like they they seem to do something, and it does improve health span. Now, are they specifically clearing up senescent cells? And and if so, what sort of senescent cells is still a big question in yep. the field, right? And and again, um. A lot of people are trying to address that now with newer technologies. Um, so we'll have to wait and watch what happens there. Are there are there better senolytic molecules than DNQ right now that people feel are, are that there's confidence that they are superior in some way? I think it's a great question. I just think we've not tested enough to know. What I mean by that is, you know, both ABT and DNQ have at least been tested in multiple models. Right. So one can say, right. oh, it's working right. on certain cells and certain stress inducers or not. The newer ones that are coming out, we've just not tested just enough. Just don't have the data set right. to know right. at this point. Okay. And, and just, again, being being a scientist, I feel like I'm always sure. careful. Yeah, no, I get it. I, like... I Believe me, I understand. <laughs> um, what about fisodin? What do you think about that as a senolytic? I mean, it definitely is is an antioxidant. It has some antioxidant capacity, um, and it seems to uh, also be this natural compound, right? Um, I, again, won't have answers about is this the best senolytic available. In the preclinical models that it's been tested, looks like it does work. Is it to, all? To clear senes- some senescent cells. Right. Yeah. But is it... Is it only clearing senescent cells and having, right. you know, no other effects? In fact, being a- almost certainly not, right? I mean, uh, uh, that's the thing with most of these natural product molecules is they have often have dozens oh, of exactly, of effects. yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's where the question is going to be. But in the end, also, especially for you, this is a question. I guess, does it matter, right? I think it I think it matters from a scientific perspective, right. but I agree from a therapeutic perspective, no. If it if it works, it works. If it has benefits that outweigh the the risks. side effects or the risks, then yeah. Yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel the same way. I mean, scientifically it matters a lot. But having said that, <laughs> I'm not convinced Fisodin actually falls in that category of having benefits that outweigh the 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 risks at this point in people. Like I I'm just not sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just I don't, don't want to mislead. Data. We were talking about Fison, right. and I don't want to mislead people into thinking that they should, you go, should take go take Fison. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I I wouldn't say that either. I I've 
not been in on any of these senolytics or otherwise um, interventions except exercise. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Is exercise a senolytic? Um, there is some newer studies talking about how exercise is beneficial and improves, um, or at least have you know people who are not people, but preclinical models where there's been exercise testing have less accumulation of senescent cells, right? But at this point, again, the question is, do we have good markers of senescence? Are we capturing sure. everything? Sure. And I mean, I think this is another, again, this is a little bit maybe semantic, but I think it's important, which is that you can have interventions where it lowers the burden of senescent cells by indirect mechanisms. Absolutely. And in particular, if it boosts the aged immune system, then Absolutely. that immune system could clear the senescent cells. So the intervention itself doesn't have to do anything directly to the senescent cells Absolutely. to reduce senescent burden. Absolutely. I mean, but I think, I guess that's a good, you know, that maybe there's a way to test it. And I'm just trying to think if there's a good way to test it, which is, you know, take plasma or something or, or just take um, blood from animals that have exercised and throw it on cells that are, senescent in vitro and see right. if like see if there's if some molecule there's increase, in there. yeah, yeah there's an increase yeah. in apoptosis of senescent cells um i actually don't think that's been done yeah um, that's interesting but you know that that could be something one could test if it really acts as a senolytic although i think it would be more like what you said is beneficial eff effects of exercise on other things that then goes into having a lower burden of senescence, right. not a direct effect. Right. Okay. Another provocative question. Um, what do you say to people who says, say there is no such thing as senescent cells? <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> maybe, maybe a better way to say it is like, what is the, what is the, the counter argument to that? Or, and maybe actually start with when when pe people have said that to you, and I know there's at least one person because we talked about this earlier, we won't name names. Um, uh, what is the context? Like, what do they mean? So why is it that there are, I don't think it's a huge number of people, but I've heard this too. Why are there people who believe that senescent cells don't exist, at least in the way that many people in the field talk about senescent cells? Like, what is the context there? Um, several things. One is um, we know with natural aging, at least, that not a whole lot of cells are senescent. So not a high burden not a in high terms of burden. percentage. If you were to just look at all the cells in a tissue, it would be a very low percent that are senescent, even in a 90-year-old. Right. Okay. Right. That's at least the idea um, based on, again, the markers that were defined earlier. Yes. So I have heard people argue that because that is true, senescence can't be a large contributor to aging, which I don't buy into that argument, but I've heard that argument. But that doesn't address senescent cells don't exist. Like the, 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 if there is a low burden of senescent cells, then by definition, senescent cells exist. So I, I wonder if that's a little bit of, you know, people not being clear in their their thinking yeah, I, I think I think there's been a couple of different things. One is the field of cellular senescence, which really came up um, with the original idea that cells proliferate and, and actually yes. came from this idea of replicative senescence. Right. In right. fibroblasts, right? Hayflick, In, Hayflick exactly. Yeah. Hayflick limit, right? Hayflick and Moorhead had, had seen this phenomena where when they cultured cells, um, they would proliferate for a number of passages, yeah. but then they would just slow down and not proliferate anymore. Right. And then this idea was connected with this loss of telomere length. Right. Right. And so there is this whole thing that because this was seen in vitro and there's been a lot of studies now um, not necessarily um, linking telomere length with aging or age-related diseases, um, I think that's also brought this idea of senescence as, eh, it doesn't happen, right? Um, but I think the, the field has really moved forward to see that replicative senescence is only one form of senescence. Right. 
And that is very important to convey. I think there are many other ways that a cell can undergo senescence. And it's basically any sort of stress that a cell undergoes um, or, or chronic stress in some way, right? Yeah. DNA damage. Um, Does mechanical stress drive senescence? Like stretching or compression? That's that's a good point, and I think there are people working on it. I just haven't seen. Yeah, it wouldn't enough surprise data. me if it did. I just I, again, I can't help it. These things pop in my head. But so actually, I think this this what you just said is really important because I think that is that is one of the that is one of the rationale that I've heard people use when they say I don't believe in senescence. What they really mean is I don't believe that the Hayflick limit. So you know the same mechanisms that drive in vitro senescence of of fibroblasts and culture happens in vivo in our bodies. I, I get that. I mean, I, I don't know whether it does or it doesn't. It probably does in some cases, but right. but that they don't believe that that's really happening to a large extent. And therefore, those types of senescent cells may not exist I mean, even in normal aging. In normal aging. Yeah. And, that, and again, that's an important context to bring up because there are obviously diseases like IPF that happen in many cases, um, it's because of loss of, you know, telomere sheltering proteins, yeah. right? Um, and what does that do? That basically um, opens up the telomeres and the lengths get shortened as well as telomere damage happens, right? right? And in that case, we do see an increase in senescence burden yeah. in these yeah. people. Yeah, and so that's, that's it's not telomere shortening for the same reason right. that Hayflick Correct. described. But it presumably everything downstream of that, the mechanism is the same. So this is maybe worth just briefly touching on, which is, again, we've talked about the idea that there are multiple ways you can get to a senescent cell, one of which is just letting the cell divide until the telomeres get so short that it triggers a DNA damage response and that drives senescence. One is at some other mechanism of exposing the telomeres or causing the telomeres to shorten, which then presumably drives the same DNA damage response. Mm -hmm. Another is reactive oxygen species, which can damage telomeres or presumably other parts of the genome. Right. So this has been fascinating. We we did sort of a really deep dive into senescence, right? And we know that one of the drivers of senescence, maybe the most important driver is, is DNA damage. But I mean, outside of senescence, like I know you've done a lot of work on the role of DNA damage in in normal aging, and I mean, what 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 do you find is really the most compelling evidence that DNA damage is a causal mechanism of aging? So it's certainly one of the hallmarks of aging, right? But in terms of like how important is it for for normal aging? Like I, I know you've done some work on this, and so maybe you can share like what is it to you that you think is really the best evidence for DNA damage as a driver of aging? And then what are some of the experimental approaches you can take to try to address that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how much does DNA damage actually play a role in aging is still an open question. The evidence that we have comes from um, patients who have been given chemotherapy mm. when they were younger, right? Um in their 40s, they seem to be developing a lot of these age-associated diseases, yeah. right? Um, and, and again, chemotherapy is more often than not DNA-damaging agents. Um, so there's definitely evidence there. Now, you could argue, is this normal aging, right? Because you're giving them high doses of DNA right. damage. This is actually an important point that, that you know, even some scientists in the field don't appreciate, but I think, I think is worth uh, emphasizing, which is that, that there are many ways experimentally that you can cause something that looks like an accelerated aging phenotype, right? And DNA damage is one way to do that, but that doesn't prove that that's what happens during normal aging, right? Or maybe an easier way for people to appreciate is there are many ways to shorten lifespan. Only a subset of those are accelerating the normal aging process, right? And so that's a sort of, you know, it's consistent with the idea that DNA damage causes aging, but there are alternative explanations that that are could also could also could be consistent with DNA damage not driving aging. Right. I mean, again, for normal aging, that that's probably true. But if you look at a larger population, especially with more kids undergoing chemotherapy now, yeah. there's still this need 
Oh, absolutely. That they have yeah, this, that's not this, to minimize right, the importance right. of helping um, people who have chemotherapy or have, have been exposed to radiation or anything right, like that, for right. sure. And and I think that's where we have to go next. So that's one one space where chemotherapy drives accelerated aging, right? And then there are these progeried um, sy syndromes yeah. in humans as well, right? Yeah. Where there's loss of a DNA repair protein and people have accelerated aging, systemic accelerated aging, not yeah. not just one tissue aging, right? So it looks like aging, but just in a, at a faster pace. Right. Now saying that, you're right, is this still applicable to normal aging or natural aging? Yeah, well, and we know when you do that, right? When, at least in mice, when you have these... Uh, DNA repair mutants or other ways of having high levels of DNA damage, what you get are high levels of apoptosis and senescence, right? So again, is it the DNA damage during normal aging that causes the aging phenotypes or is it the apoptosis and senescence and other stuff? And a lot of DNA damage is one way to get there. I think that's kind of the, the, right. the question right. that and, I've and, got. And, and that's where we still have so much to do. Um, but one one way to start addressing that question and, and what we are trying to do now, all the new work, is we have seen, again, with, with newer technologies, it's been easier to do. We now know that oxidative DNA lesions do increase with age. Mm -hmm. Okay, Whether they are causative or not is still a question. So we have developed a chemooptogenetic tool um, with Can Carnegie you define Mellon. what that word means for people? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So w what this what this means, what this tool is, is we can attach a small peptide to anything of interest. In our case, we are interested in causing damage only to the DNA, mm -hmm. right? So we have attached a small peptide to a histone that would only be there on the DNA. Now. Why it's called chemooptogenetic is when we add a chemical called malachite green, it binds to this peptide, it stabilizes it, but only when you shine red light on it, it produces a singlet oxygen. Now, singlet oxygen cannot diffuse far, so it basically attacks whatever's next to it. And this is how it's going to create an oxidative DNA lesion. Yeah. And now by controlling you know, how much damage, where and when in your lifespan, right? In your, during your aging process, we induce these lesions. We can now start testing whether DNA damage actually plays a role in natural aging, right? Um, and I think that's kind of been a missing piece. So we're really excited about doing this in, a, in an organism way because so, and this this work is work you're doing in c elegans right so we haven't talked much about c elegans but you've got a, a c elegans component to your research and so this is in c elegans and is this being done in c elegans in part because the optogenetic piece is easier there because they're tra transparent and you can control the delivery and and all of that also lifespan and yeah, health right. span. And, and you can do it faster <laughs> cheaper faster absolutely. better absolutely yes we get it <laughs> absolutely no but the goal is we you know we would love to do this in animal systems but trying well, to elegans get are animals uh, i don't want sorry, i don't want sorry. To, you know i'm, a, I'm sorry a former sea um, elegans guy mammalian <laughs> systems as well but i think to start with, and 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 we've learned so much about genetics and interventions yeah. from C. Uh, yeah, I you've mean, got a lot of tools to work with. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's just no way to do it in any other system better, I think. Now, is senescence a thing in C. elegans? That's controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in in principle, your your system should. If it is right, you should be able to drive senescence through inducing DNA damage. Yeah, but we don't have good markers yeah. of senescence. It may be a different in, flavor of senescence. In C. And I mean, here's the issue, right? The key defining feature, of course, is irreversible cell cycle arrest, and C. elegans are post mitotic exactly. adults. Exactly. So their cells aren't. Their cells are irreversibly arrested. You know, at the end of development, right. at least the adult. Right, Body Ex cells. exactly. And I think years ago, um, I remember talking to Judy Campisi about this. Yeah. And she had done some early studies where, you know, she took C. elegans and did S.A. beta gal just to see, <laughs> right? Um, and, and she didn't see anything. Yeah. Um, but since then, again, we've kind of moved away. A lot of people have moved away from S.A. beta gal as yeah. well. So. Yeah. And I mean, again, I think, I think the, 
one one way you could maybe try to start addressing this is to ask if you say cause these high levels of DNA damage um, in aged animals and look at single cell gene expression transcriptomics, are there signatures there that seem to be unique to this state of high levels of DNA damage? Does it prove that they're senescent, right, in, yeah. in the, the classical sense? But th those signatures may overlap with some of the signatures you see in senescent cells in mammals, which would be in, intriguing, I think. Right, absolutely. I mean, the first few ones that we always think about do not exist in, in C. elegans, like P21, right. P16, right? And that's kind of been like a little bit of a... Um, challenge. But I think now again that one can do single cell, even in, in C. elegans, and then people have done that brilliantly. Um, I think there is much more that we can explore. And if we can even know which of these cells have damage because of our chemooptogenetic system and where exactly we are causing that damage, yeah. right? Um, we may be able to start addressing these can questions. Can you use this system in fruit flies? Because that may be a place where you could do some of these experiments too. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could we could adapt it in 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 fruit flies as well. I'm not actually suggesting you start working with fruit <laughs> flies. We did that for a little bit, and um, yeah, it was yeah. a challenge. But yeah, but, well, at the Aging <laughs> Institute, the good part is find there a collaborator are other who's yeah. got a fly and <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. I wouldn't take up another model yeah. organism <laughs> because that will definitely affect my aging process. Uh, yes. Oh, fruit flies more than some others I can attest to from experience. Um, anything that you would like to talk about that we haven't had a chance to talk about today? Well, I, I want to talk about your um, talk this this yeah. morning. Okay, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> um, I kind of wanted you to summarize that for uh. your audience because, I, I again, I think it was such a provocative talk and, and really bringing up some very important questions for the aging field. Yeah. Okay. So I won't, I'm not going to go through the whole talk. I think what I tried to do was, um, so the talk was like reflections on a quarter century in aging biology or something like that was the title of the talk. And again, that, that title really came from the fact that, that, you know, I left academia about a year ago uh, and it was almost to the day, 25 years from when I started studying aging as a graduate student. So just realizing that, oh my God, I've been doing this for a quarter century. That's a long time. But then thinking about how the field had ch has changed in that time, a lot of the progress, some of the um, lessons I think that 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 could be learned from you know false starts, mistakes, um, some of the big advances that those are the kinds of things I tried to talk about and also try to get people to think about you know given where we're at now, um, what are maybe some of the some of the big questions that are important to ask. And so like one of the questions that I posed was, did the field become too narrow too quickly, right? In other words, you know, when I came into the field, lots of genome wide sort of studies, unbiased screens, lots of new genetics of aging being discovered. Um, and we moved away from that. And that's mm -hmm. natural as a field matures. It becomes more mechanistic, more focused. We defined the hallmarks of aging. Mm -hmm. But as part of that, I think, um, you know, an unintentional consequence is that 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 those hallmarks of aging, when they became a paradigm, right, for the field, made it much difficult, much more difficult for people to think outside of that paradigm. And so, one of the questions I'm asking is, you know, do the hallmarks tell us everything about aging? I don't think anybody would would say they do, but of what bio biological aging is, are the hallmarks? 90% of it or 80% of it or 10% of it or 0.0001% of it. I don't mm -hmm. think we know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. So it's a question. I'm not trying to argue that, that, that the hallmarks of aging are not important or uh, useful, but I do wonder if there's a lot more out there that we don't know. And because the field has become so narrow, um, nobody's looking for it. So that was one of the big questions that I I posed and hopefully hopefully got people to think a little bit and you No, know, it did you know. bring me back to thinking about senescence because you yeah. know this is exactly what's happened to the field of senescence as well, you know, in in some in some sense. Yeah, right. Um I think we became narrow very quickly by just thinking oh there are these 
three or four markers and that's right. about it right? right and that's why i wanted to bring this up because i think again we kind of have to in our quest for understanding the biology of senescence and aging better we kind of have to take a step back and and kind of think about oh hold on like we need to take a pause um and i guess like the field has to keep doing that several times to actually solve the big questions yeah and i mean i think one other one of the themes that i sort of alluded to is this idea that there are you know there are new ideas that become really really popular everybody's super excited about them and then 5 years later they kind of die off and sometimes they come back and i i talked about telomeres right and we've touched on telomeres like when i was a graduate student telomeres were very hot topic in the mm -hmm, field, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody thought, if we just lengthen telomeres, we'll cure aging, right? And then that turned out not to be the case, as far as we can tell. And so they become very unpopular for a while, and then they come back. And and I mean, I feel like senescence, in some ways, senescence is still really hot, but in the aging field, maybe not as hot as it used to be, right? It's become much more exciting in like the cancer field and the diabetes field, which is great, actually, for the 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 aging field, because I think senescence has actually been one of the factors that has has led to people outside of aging studying aging mm -hmm. indirectly. But mm -hmm. all of this is just to say there are these ups and downs and pendulum swings and what people get excited about. And we need to, I think, you know, try not to get too high or too low on these Correct. things um, and try to maintain that idea of putting it in context and recognizing that at least for now, there is no magic bullet. There is no no you know central regulator of aging, right? right. Um, that we know of, right? Uh, and so we need to recognize what we know and what we don't know. I guess the other the other thing that I said, which um, uh, I believe very strongly and hopefully resonated with people, is the idea that it's really important to keep trying to break our models. In other words, in science, if you do good science. Um, you should always be trying to disprove your models, right? And I think, unfortunately, there have been some, you know, high-profile stories in the the field of aging, and I'm sure this is true in other fields mm -hmm. as well. You know that 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 kind of became mistakes that misled the field for many many years because people were so focused on trying to prove their model that they left out data that didn't fit the model, and that led to a lot of people believing things that that weren't actually correct and it took a long time to clean that up whereas right. i think if 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 more people had really been focused on asking you know why doesn't that data actually make sense within an, our model trying to disprove the model then you can always you know make the model better that's the whole thing like i tell i've told this it to lots true. of people in my lab like you know what your model's wrong get used to it Yes. Every model is wrong. <laughs> yes. Go tell me how it's wrong. Go figure out how it's wrong. I think if, I think that's really how we should be approaching all yeah. these questions. And that's why we always have a working model. You know, yeah. I, I always like all my slides have this working model rather than actually like, yeah. this is the model. No, like I, I think it just changes with every new piece of data and you get. Should. And yeah. it should. Yeah, I agree. Um, And, and I, I think you made an important point there about testing your model and not proving. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it, doesn't sound like for other people they're like Ugh, why does that one word yeah. make a difference but yeah. it does yeah it does it, i think the frame the frame of mind you go into the experiment with makes a huge difference and, and again two reasons one i already mentioned which is that if you are set out to prove your model you are more likely to if you get a data point that doesn't fit your model or an experiment that comes out different than the model mm -hmm. predicts, you're more likely to think there was something wrong with the experiment than you are to think there was something wrong with your model. And that can mislead you and everyone else. So that's that. That's one reason. The other thing I would say just from experience is the biggest discoveries that my lab ever made were when we got results we didn't expect. And we're Absolutely. like, oh my God, that, that's crazy. We didn't expect that. What is that? Why is it? Why? What does that mean? And you're like, wow, that means something really interesting. So yeah. I think from a, the perspective of, at least for me, what made makes science fun is getting those unexpected results, Absolutely. which then lead you in a new direction. Yeah. As long as it's interpretable. <laughs> well, this is right. Uh, yeah. I, I, we had plenty of results that we couldn't interpret or or we just, we were never able to figure out what it meant. That yeah. That's true. But again, I think you have to be open. You have to, Absolutely. You're going to be a better scientist if you go into your experiments with the idea that 
um, like you said, it's a working model. And the goal is to come up with new data that allows you to make your model closer mm-hmm. to reality, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyways, that, that that's most of I don't remember what else I talked about. That was most of it. Um, but it was a great one. So. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, hopefully most of the people, hopefully it made people think. That was the goal. I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. We, <laughs> hopefully a lot it made of people, people think something other than Matt should stop talking. <laughs> no, I, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people were at my poster and we ended up talking about, oh, wow. you know, your talk. And that's already telling, that's right? That's very that, nice to That hear, means yeah. that people are asking these questions and it was definitely thought provoking. So Good, good. Um, well, thank you. So this has been a lot of fun and I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm glad we had a chance to do this and, um, we will maybe do it again once your paper comes out and we can talk about that very cool top secret (laughs) stuff that I now know and you don't know. Uh Oh, (laughs) awesome. Okay. So thanks everyone for tuning in to the OptiSpan podcast as always. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and I hope to see you next time. Thank you for having me, Matt.